Okay, um, welcome to the medicine and health session of the virtual SIB days 2020. I'm uh, very excited that already like 120 participants are here in this uh, session. And uh, we're very optimistic that it will be a, a great session because we have a perfect lineup of speakers. And the chairs of this session are Kosia Popadin from the Laboratory of the Human Genomics of Infection Immunity at the APF in Lausanne. And I, Katja Bernfaller, I'm a group leader at the Institute of Allergy and Asthma Research uh, up in the folks. Uh, some organizational things during the presentations. Uh, the people in the audience can submit their questions through the question and answers or Fragen and Antworten um, uh, feature. And they can also upvote questions that are posted by others. And when you submit a question, please keep it short and simple. And also uh, remember to specify the, the speaker's name. Uh, after the 10 minute talks, some questions from the question and answer feature will be asked by the chairs, uh, as long as the session is running uh, on, on schedule. All the other questions are then passed to the uh, meet the speaker session which is directly following the last presentation. And these questions will also be asked by the chairs who will select questions, also taking into account the upvotes by the uh, uh, attendees. So with this, I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker, Francesca Singer. Uh, she works in the Nexus group of Daniel Steckhofen at ETH Zurich, and her talk will be on single cell RNA sequencing analysis of tumor biopsies. So Francesca, the floor is yours, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to a short introduction into the single cell RNA analysis and how we can use it to have a closer look at tumor immunity and their immune microenvironment. Um, so why do we want to use single cell RNA sequencing to have a closer look at tumors? Well, they're not uh, very homogeneous, but rather they are composed of very different cell types and each cell has a different function. So single cell sequencing helps us to bring us from a bulk perspective to actually a, a closer investigation of the individual cell types depicted here and also how individual cells differ from each other, from their neighbors. And uh, ultimately, when we, when we bring this into a clinical setting, so how can this help us? Well, we can look at tumors, at their heterogeneity. We can look at what immune cells are present in the samples or at the microenvironment. But also we can look at gene expression, pathway activation. And ultimately, we can try uh, to tackle the question what treatments might be effective for this patient. And of course, there are certain challenges um, to bring single cell sequencing into a clinical application. First of all, it's a high throughput method. So uh, we have a wealth of data that needs to be sorted and that needs to be put into a clinical context. And also we need to perform a robust analysis and it needs to be well documented and it needs to be reproducible. And uh, so we try to um, address some of these challenges um, by um, creating a workflow that is embedded into a snake make environment. And here you see a bird's eye perspective and overview of this workflow where we try to use single cell RNA sequencing to have a closer look at tumors and to also report um, information that could be potentially useful for the clinics. So um, just an overview. So we have these transcripts, which are barcoded to be, um, to, to be labeled um, to which cell they belong. And we do have a count matrix where cells and genes are represented. And uh, this is further uh, filtered and post-processed such uh, that we can do an expression profile analysis. Mainly here, we compare cells with each other, looking at how similar they are and whether they can be grouped. But also we compare this to um, a priori defined cell type marker lists in order to do a cell type classification. And ultimately what we, what we want to know is the sample composition, meaning for instance, what types of immune cells are in our sample, but also what are the different tumor populations that we potentially see. 
And this brings us to the reporting part here. I listed uh, some examples of what we can do. Of course, gene expression, but also the differentiation state of certain populations. So the velocity can be very informative. We can do pathway analysis, and we can also do differential gene expression comparing different clusters. Um, and ultimately, this can be used for an in silico drug prediction. Here, um, the differentially expressed genes are linked to um, further investigate this for uh, being a potential drug target. Um, just very few details. Uh, first of all, the basic steps where the take home message is mainly um, the, the pipeline already takes care of uh, filtering, of uh, um, trying to help you to get a high quality data set. So uh, we use the arranger for an initial mapping of the reads and the gene annotation. And then, as you can see here, with some QC example plots, we do various kinds of contamination removal and filtering, including uh, removing cells that are potentially empty droplets, and also those um, that have uh, high mitochondrial gene content, that would be the red ones here, um, because these might be likely uh, dying or broken cells. And then another important aspect is the normalization and also the cell cycle correction. We don't want our cells to be grouped just according to their cell cycle phase. So ideally, we get something um, that is depicted over here. Each cell is colored by the cell cycle phase. And as you can see, um, after correction, we have a well-mixed sample, not driven by the cell cycle phase. Uh, two core functionalities of the pipeline are the clustering, which is the um, grouping of similar cells according to their expression profile, and the cell type classification. So for cell type classification, we would take here these, these, these rows, these gene expression profiles of cells, and we would compare each cell to a priori defined um, cell type marker lists, which are genes that should be highly expressed in a particular cell type. And uh, what we calculate is a similarity score that tells us uh, what is my cell, what, what cell type is my cell. So uh, depicted here in this heat map, um, each, each cell is a column. And um, the, the more red uh, we are, the, the more likely it is that, uh, that my cell is of a particular cell type. So uh, what this does is basically it avoids the manual annotation of my sample, but it rather does an automated cell type classification. So just showing some examples of what could be potential readouts of uh, such an analysis. Here I show you an example of a lymph node metastasis uh, of a melanoma patient. Uh, in red, you see, the, you see the, the melanoma cells, and then we have uh, diverse types of immune cells. And here, uh, of course, you don't uh, have to read all of this, but I think what is obvious is we can distinguish many different types of cells, even um, subtypes of immune cells, which are typically hard to distinguish. And uh, very importantly, we can relate this also to the gene expression of individual genes, for instance, of cell type marker genes, for instance, here depicted as 100B, which uh, is, is expressed in the melanoma cells as a melanoma marker. But then also uh, important for clinical decision making, for instance, for immunotherapy, um, are the gene expression, for instance, of CTLA4 on the T cells or uh, of MHC class 1 on the tumor. And all of this can be addressed um, by putting basically the sample composition side by side to the individual gene expression. And my final example uh, is on the tumor heterogeneity. Here I picked an ovarian cancer sample, and in red you see the ovarian cancer cells. And just on first glance, what you would think is that this is a very homogeneous tumor. However, if you um, put this side by side with the clustering as depicted here, then you see that actually the tumor is made of several populations, which are possibly different from each other, which could be important for, the, uh, for a treatment decision. And if we go further and actually ask ourselves, what makes them different. Then, for instance, the pathway analysis can help, which you see here, uh, just example excerpts um, that show us that we, we seem to have two major populations which actually differ in terms, for instance, of oxidative phosphorylation, mismatch repair, or MEPK pathway. So at a glance, you see um, what could be um, potential differences of these populations. 
And with that, I want to uh, thank the whole Nexus team and uh, in particular our single cell experts that uh, worked a lot to, to bring this pipeline to life. And then also our great collaborators um, from the Genomics Facility in Basel, from the University Hospital Zurich and the University of Basel. And of course you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, uh, Francesca. Um, there's been a question on the uh, question and answer section um, by Julian Roux. Um, how many steps of the single second analysis uh, do require quality checks, manual thresholding, choice of ad hoc criteria, and how do we perform these in an automated workflow? Like, are there checkpoints in your analysis? It, um, I try to address this um, point by point. It's a rather long question, so I hope yeah. I can do all of it. Um, so, I mean, ideally, every step should be quality controlled, right? I mean, I think it's most important to have a solid um, 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 basis of your data. So um, controlling the mapping, controlling whether uh, the genes and cells that you have are actually um, not contaminants, for instance, the cell filtering that I was talking about. I think it's very important to reach uh, a clean data set here. But then also, I mean, always, uh, for instance, for, for clustering and cell type classification, also here, it's important to always double check, I would say. Could this be uh, doublets? Could this be a wrong cell type that I assigned here? So I would say it's, it's important in all stages to have a quality control, if possible. And the second part, how much is this automatable or so how much automation can we have? Uh, how, how do you perform this in an automated workflow? So, um, so in SnakeMake, uh, what is very handy is so we do have like it's a config file where you say you have some default parameters and uh, based um, so how we, how how we do this based on the cancer type at hand, we would uh, specify certain let's say parameters uh, that by default uh, would do a robust analysis of this uh, particular cancer type. And this can be adapted to, to other cancer types. But uh, basically SnakeMake uh, uh, is very flexible and gives you the tools at hand to, to do this in an automated fashion on diverse data sets. So everything that I was shown here is really just kicking off once and then you, you get all these plots um, automatically. Okay. Uh, thanks for the answer. We will go over to the next speaker and ask the remaining questions in the um, meet the speaker session following the, the session. Okay, so our next speaker is Fabian Arnold, who is the head of the Laboratory of Molecular Tumor Profiling, University mm -hmm. Hospital of Zurich. And he will present today a new software which helps to understand the patient's tumor profile and helps in clinical decision making. So, Fabian, the floor is yours. You're welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. So just small comment. I'm not the head, uh, <laughs> just to make that clear, but that's, uh, that's fine. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Um, as uh, mentioned, I'm actually from the university hospital. Um, so it's for me very exciting to be able to give a talk here. And maybe I, I can also give you a bit of insights into the clinic. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, the empty pit pilot. And that's a, a browser-based application that we developed for essentially efficient and interactive visualization of NGS data at molecular tumor boards. So I'm uh, going to give you a small background uh, to why we had the motivation to do this application. Um, so we are, um, our lab is called Molecular Tumor Profiling. It's a lab at the university hospital. And we are uh, doing a high throughput um, genomic uh, panel testing of cancer patients. So it's DNA sequencing. And uh, we process typically more than 25 samples per week. And it's a collaboration uh, together with Foundation Medicine. And um, we deliver the Foundation Medicine tests uh, for, the, for the Swiss cancer patients. And we have a lot of samples and many of them uh, the NGS results that are summarized in the medical report for many of those patients, uh, the NGS results are discussed um, at the US set at the molecular tumor board. That's essentially a board where oncologists, uh, pathologists, uh, bioinformaticians sit together and based on the NGS results, they discuss uh, the best uh, therapy recommendation for a patient. So essentially, 
at the end from an NGS result, we will get a tumor board report, which has a therapy recommendation. And here we encounter some problems. So uh, one big problem is uh, oncologists, especially those from university hospitals are really uh, very busy people. So there is a limited amount of time to discuss each patient. And as you might know, um, NGS results, they are getting increasingly complex. So in the clinics, we have larger and larger panels. We have more biomarkers. It's getting more complex. And there is simply not enough time to manually analyze all the data and all the possible aspects. So we came up with a solution, which is MTP Pilot, which uh, tries to, to provide automated uh, comprehensive annotation for NGS results in a user-friendly interface and also having uh, linkage to common databases and interactive tools to visualize the mutations, uh, all of which would not be possible to do on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, in a nutshell, um, what it is, it's essentially you take a medical report from the left, which is, includes NGS data, which is very uh, text heavy and not easy to analyze quickly, and you pack that into a web-based solution, which uh, is more intuitive and uh, faster to understand. And it's essentially a web-based solution. So we have a front end with HTML and JavaScript and the back end, in our case, it's a PHP solution with connected to our SQL database. So how does it look like? Um, we have um, a menu on the, on the left side where we essentially have the patients uh, for a certain given tumor board. We have, of course, uh, a section uh, number two with the patient and specimen information. By the way, that's all anonymized, so no worries. And um, we have uh, resources in section three, where we have a patient matcher, which I will come to in briefly. And then we have uh, number four and five. We have a panel with the genomic signatures, which in case for the foundation medicine tests are the MS status and the TMB, and an ideogram automatically uh, generated with all the mutations for this patient. And these two together, so the signatures and the ideogram, they're very simple tools, but they already give us um, a very uh, fast and easy glance at overall uh, tumor uh, status of the patient. So whether the patient has a lot of mutations, whether there are a lot of copy number alterations, which may be indicative of genomic instability, and so on. And then the core section is actually number six, um, which is this comprehensive automated annotation of the mutations. And how does that look like? So I will go through it step by step. So number one, two, three, four, it's not so interesting for you. That's essentially just automatically um, the annotation of the mutation at the protein level, uh, the genetic level. However, then in number six, um, we automatically link these mutations uh, to common use databases. What's very often used in the clinics, it's a database like Cosmic, ClinVar, or OncoKB. So you have an automatic linkage, um, which will tell you whether this mutation is uh, described as significant, pathogenic, and so on. Very useful is also number seven. Um, we have um, automatically uh, linked the mutation to uh, smart domains. So you immediately see whether your mutation is, um, is affecting a functional domain of the protein, which might also help a lot understanding the mutation, especially in the case of frame shifts in tumor suppressor genes. So you can immediately assess what part of the protein is actually lost. Um, we have then other fields, uh, nine and 10, uh, we check databases to check whether a mutation is somatic or germline, which is also always uh, an important topic during these tumor boards. And what we also have in point 11 is actually a 3D viewer. And um, that actually allows us to, um, that's automatically generated and it maps the mutation here displayed as a sphere model um, to a suitable PDB uh, model. So you can immediately see for each mutation if there is a PDB available, where the mutation sits, whether it might affect the function of the protein. Uh, then some other uh, smaller features I will present quickly is we also have a fusion visualization. So fusion are quite complex mutations and they are uh, not always really easy to understand, especially if we do uh, if you do DNA uh, panel sequencing, which is done a lot in the clinics. So the breakpoints are not always very clear. The orientation might not be clear of the fusion. So essentially this tool helps um, 
it's also automatically generated and it helps to uh, characterize the fusion. So where the breakpoints uh, are, which domains are affected, how the final fusion could look like. And eventually, and this is linked to our database. So um, uh, by this time we have now a lot of patients in our database and we have a patient matcher. So that allows us to match um, to match a molecular profile of a given patient to other patients. And that can be helpful, for example, to maybe confirm a diagnosis. So in this particular case, you see this patient has a, it's a hallmark fusion, it's a temperance fusion, that's a hallmark for prostate cancer. And you see other prostate cancer patients then pop up. So that might help um, identify the diagnosis or might also help with treatment. And uh, with that, I'm actually, towards the end already. So the status quo now is our current local solution. It's uh, obviously it's integrated with the database, uh, with our patient database that feeds the, the pilot software. And this is then what we present at the tumor board. But on a longer term, uh, we want to, to publish this as well and then offer like a community uh, web-based solution where essentially you can upload, for example, your VSCF files uh, on a browser-based and you get almost, uh, very similar interface just with your results. And um, so that brings me already to knowledge. And so I want to thank, of course, Martin Socher. He's um, the actual head <laughs> and uh, he enabled uh, also the, um, the whole project. Uh, big to Abdullah, he will present later as well. And he actually did a lot of the back end programming for, um, for this. And then, also thanks to pathologists and oncologists that helped as well designing it. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks for your attention. Thank you, Fabian, a lot for your interesting presentation. So we have maybe time for one uh, last question. So I have, I see a question from Robert Ivanek. Uh, so as soon as you need to uh, decrease dimension, the complexity and present it to clinicians, how you prioritize, what is the rank of uh, mutations or gen genetic rearrangement, which you present to clinicians, how you decide it? Um, so actually, uh, Foundation of Medicine, in our case, already does a certain ranking for us. So they already rank by pathogenicity, whether a mutation is significant and pathogenic, and they will rank mutations that are not clearly pathogenic as variants of and So that's automatically done, actually, by many, actually, providers of panel sequencing. Okay. But what we, what we can do with the soft, yeah. So with this, I think we go to next uh, speaker, yeah. Katia. Um, thank you. Um, next speaker will be uh, Julian Dragan. He's a scientist in the Digital IT group, the competence, competence mathematics and computational biology of the SIB in Lausanne. And he will present, um, he as Swiss knife analysis tool. The floor is yours, Julian. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to present uh, DS Swiss Knife, which is a package we uh, wrote here in the, in the Vital IT group of the SIB, uh, in order to uh, facilitate the federated uh, data analysis. Uh, as many of you know, the, we have a, a problem with the, with the sensitive data, and that is that uh, they are often siloed. Uh, that is because uh, uh, ethical and legal constraints prevent sharing of clinical data, and uh, that's, that is especially true across borders. Uh, also, historical data are in different formats uh, and levels of granularity. Uh, think of different variable names or uh, non-standard uh, variable un uh, measurement units. And also, uh, the methods for uh, use for analysis are not standardized. So uh, we try to solve some of these problems by bringing the analysis to the data. 
uh, we uh, set up we have set up as part of a as part of a, a large European consortium uh, for type 2 diabetes we set up a federated database comprising 10 clinical co cohorts across Europe these cohorts are uh, uh, connected to a central uh, server uh, at SIB and in order to uh, perform this federated analysis uh, the software execution is distributed over a data network and uh, uh, only summary data the summary level data uh, for instance partial means mean values or regression coefficients are returned in this model the analysis is brought to the data no individual data ever leaves its origin server only aggregates are shared Uh, this was achieved using uh, an R package that we call DS3 Snife. We implemented several, several modeling uh, uh, analysis methods, uh, amongst them uh, principal component analysis, k-means clustering, and uh, random forests. Uh, these uh, these uh, methods are designed to work on virtual cohorts. By virtual cohorts, we, we, we mean aggregations of individual cohorts existent on the remote nodes. This, this is like running a model on a virtual cohort is, will yield exactly the same coefficients or model or results that you, you would obtain on the full data set present on, uh, on the analyst computer. Uh, the package works with open source software on the, on uh, the uh, Opal infrastructure and uh, with the data shield uh, uh, R uh, package. Uh, we are actually following the data shield consortium in uh, in this um, on this path. It's them who who opened this uh, by implemented uh, by implementing uh, remote federated GLM models. So within uh, IMI Rhapsody, we have built a federated database uh, with about uh, 50,000 uh, patients. And uh, for the analysis, uh, the patients are uh, in different stages of, of the disease. Uh, some of them are ill, some of them are pre-diabetic. Uh, we chose uh, three cohorts of uh, diabetics uh, totaling about 25,000 patients to perform a combined k-means cluster analysis. Uh, so we, we built this virtual cohort and uh, with on, uh, on five uh, phenotypic variables which are age, BMI, C-peptide, uh, glycated hemoglobin and uh, HDL. Uh, we executed the k-means algorithm modified to work on federated data and uh, we obtained uh, results like so. This is a, a plot of the results. The, the, the acronyms on the right are uh, known from the literature. Uh, the first one is, for instance, severe insulin deficient diabetes. And we can see from the plots that, uh, that uh, the clusters are the measures for the cluster, for this cluster of uh, severe insulin deficient diabetes, it's quite different from the severe insulin resistant diabetes, which is the second one. Uh, furthermore, these results that we obtained are uh, uh, quite similar to, to what uh, is known from the literature and also quite similar to what we obtain from each individual node, but uh, that wouldn't have been necessarily the, the case. So we had to combine them to, to make sure we will obtain the same results. Uh, going very quickly forward, uh, I will show you that we managed to, to uh, execute also a federated PCA on the virtual cohort to, to visualize the, the separation between the clusters. Uh, here, the, 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 we, we, we can see clouds and not individual points, obviously, because we, we are not allowed to see individual uh, measures, even, even uh, on uh, principal components. Uh, and uh, 
these are two of the of the clusters we uh, we managed to uh, see on the first uh, visualized on the first two principal components i just want to say that uh, um, this pca illustrates how data can be combined on the fly to get a global overview this analysis is not limited by the number of variables it is not uh, bandwidth hungry or cpu hungry uh, the algorithms run in time, in matters of minutes and as you have seen uh, 25000 patients is quite an important number uh, so uh, we, we are pretty content with uh, with the, with the results and uh, this would be the key mis message the swiss knife is an innovative toolkit for remote analysis of virtual cohorts without any sharing of sensitive data. I would like to yeah, end just, by... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I want uh, to your talk with the key message. Um, we're running very late, so we will hand over right now to the next talk. Thank you, Julian, a lot. Thank you. Okay, so in our next speaker is uh, Maria Livia of Amiglietti. Uh, so she is a researcher at Swiss Prod Group, and today she will present to us a way how to integrate genome and variation data with the knowledge of protein function and disease. So you're welcome, Maria. Thank you. So trying, I'm trying to share the screen. Voila. Here we are. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Everybody, I would like to present you work currently done at SwissProt that aims to increase the utility of UniProt as a platform to link genome variation data with knowledge of protein function. And this can be done thanks to the richness of annotations that are present in UniProt KB SwissProt. As you know, UniProt KB SwissProt provides plenty of information on proteins including protein sequences, sequence features, protein function, but also we provide information on human genetic variants and their involvement in disease, particularly Mendelian diseases with um, uh, highly high penetrance. And we also provide uh, information on the functional impact of genetic variants. However, this information is provided as free text. Therefore, in order to make our data useful, we need to standardize the annotation. So our work now is standardizing annotations of variant clinical significance, as well as annotation of variant functional impact. Um, for the variant clinical significance, the upper, in the upper part of the slides, you can see how variants are actually annotated in SwissProt. We provide the position of the variant at protein level, the amino acid change, and if a variant is found in a disease, we indicate in plus disease short name. The standardization work consists in applying the SMG guidelines and terminology for variant interpretation and reporting so that we define the variant at nucleotide level using the HVS nomenclature and we use the five pathogenicity categories that are used in ClinVar to indicate the clinical significance. For, in this example, the variant is likely pathogenic for lactic acidu aciduria. The standardized annotations are linked to PubMed ID. They are stored in, in an internal variant database and are also submitted to ClinVar. So these annotations are not yet available through SwissProt, but through ClinVar. Uh, up to now, we have standardized over 1,000 variant interpretations, most of them submitted to ClinVar. And Almost 800 are already released, therefore public in ClinVar. For the functional impact of variants, we move from free text to machine readable data using control vocabulary from the variation ontology, Vario, and from, from Go, as well as when needed from KB. In this example, 
I show that various terms are used. One, to describe the protein property that is affected, in this case, protein function. There is a various term that describes the type of effect. In this case, this is a loss of function mutation. And the go term is used to name the process that is affected. Again, the standardized annotation is associated with a PubMed ID and is stored in an internal variant database. Up to now, we have standardized over 14,000 functional annotation, and we have created a corpus of over 3,000 PubMed ID of articles on functional relevant variants. So, in the future, what we will do is retrofitting the standardized annotation of clinical significance and functional impact from the internal variant database to SwissProt. We continue sharing our interpretation with ClinVar, and we are going to use the corpus of PubMed ID from our internal database to train a deep learning classifier and be able to identify literature on functional variants. This will allow us to prioritize our work so that in, in the future we will focus annotation on novel and rare variants that have functional impact. Swiss Pro activities are funded by SERI and by NIH. I would like also to thank all my colleagues at, at Swiss Pro that contributed to the work. And with this, thank you very much for, for your attention. Maria Olivia, thank you a lot for your presentation. Thanks for being thank you. precisely the time. But because we are late, we, we have to go directly to the next speaker. Next speaker is Maria Dmitrieva. She is a PhD student in the group of Christian von Merin at the University of Zurich. And today she will present analysis of lung microbiome in patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, Maria, floor is yours. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. So hello everyone. And as have uh, as Konstantin briefly introduced, I'm a PhD student at the lab for Christian van Mering. Today I will be presenting the project that we did in collaboration with Dr. Carlet's team at the Cantonal Hospital St. Gallen. So just a brief note of why the lung microbiome is so special. Uh, in essence, it's an open system. So it's kind of exposed to the environment. We breathe in microbes from the environment, we breathe out. There are certain conditions in the lung that allow certain bacteria to grow or to not grow, but mostly the lung is a sterile environment. Now, what happens in cystic fibrosis is that these people have a mutation that results in the airways within the lung being carried, in, being covered in really sticky mucus. And this mucus prevents bacteria from getting expelled, and it also provides a nutritious, nutritious environment. So these bacteria overgrow the lungs, colonize the lungs, and as a result, patients with cystic fibrosis frequently suffer from respiratory infections. And even though some of the therapies can help with that, it's still quite a big problem. So, what we wanted to do in this project is to follow a small cohort of patients and over a period of several months, and then to use shotgun metagenomics to characterize their lung microbiome, because current clinical methods provide only a limited overview. Okay, so here you see an example of one of the patients in our cohort who we followed for over 15 months. During these 15 months, we took 10 samples and the patient essentially just expelled sputum from the lungs and this was taken for shotgun metagenomic sequencing. As you can see, there has been some variation over time, but in general, there are just a few bacteria that dominate the whole lung microbiome. Among these bacteria, there are a couple of well-known cystic fibrosis pathogens and perhaps the most famous one is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So what I would like to show you now is that this Pseudomonas aeruginosa is in fact not just a simple single population, but actually contains a mix of different subpopulations. 
what we did was we called single nucleotide variations on the Pseudomonas aeruginosa genome. And because we have several time points, we can obtain a kind of temporal profile of how this variation becomes more or less abundant. And then we have, of course, several thousands of variation across the whole genome that if we cluster, we observe seven distinct clusters that have a pretty known uh, high allele frequency and also show a different uh, temporal pattern. Now, I would say that three of these clusters, so one, two, and three, have very distinct shapes. And then when we check the other four, there seem to be derivatives of these three clusters. So in our hypothesis, these are three different strain variants of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the same patient. And finally, what I would like to show you is that these strain variants differ not only by single nucleotides, but also in large regions of the genome. So what you see is coverage profiles of the genome from different time points. And for example, there's a region like the one here that has different coverage at different time points. And if we look at how this normalized coverage um, changes over time, then we can see that the shape almost perfectly corresponds to strain variant one, indicating that it's only present in this strain variant and not present in the other two. Although we couldn't define the exact function, we know that this contains some kind of metabolic genes. So with that, I hope I've given you at least some insight in how we can combine metagenomic sequencing and longitudinal sampling in order to gain more insight into the heterogeneous populations within a cystic fibrosis lungs. And with that, I would like to finish. I will have a poster later this afternoon that you feel free to come by and discuss it. And on the top, you see the QR code for our preprint, which is out. So thank you. Okay, Maria, thank you a lot uh, for presentation and thank you for to, to be in time. I think we will leave a uh, question for, for later discussion and we will mm -hmm. switch to the next presenter. Thank you. So the next talk will be by Iman Downhauer, uh, who is a PhD student in the group of Julia Vogt at ETH Zurich. And he will speak on early phototherapy prediction tool to detect hyperbilirubinemia. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. So I'll be presenting joint work with the Children's Hospital of uh, the University of Basel here. And as already pointed out, we'll be talking about the early detection of neonatal jaundice, um, which I'll introduce on the next slide. So jaundice is known as one of the most common pathologies in newborns. It is caused by uh, overly high bilirubin values. Uh, bilirubin is a common blood measurement. And in fact, uh, around 60% of the newborn babies turn yellow. Uh, within the first days of life, which is the typical uh, physiological sign of neonatal jaundice. Uh, approximately 10% of children require phototherapy treatment within the first days of life. Um, and um, the problem with untreated hyperbilirubinemia is that it can cause major disability with lifelong consequences, and in particular due to the recent trend of shorter hospitalization, uh, there is an increased risk of critical jaundice recently. So here you see how typically a phototherapy looks like. Not very nice for the child, but it's also rather one of the milder forms of therapy. So it's a task that is really suited for, for early detection with machine learning. Uh, in particular, in this instance, we'll be analyzing data on 362 newborns. Uh, for each of which we have up to 44 variables measured. A particular challenge with this data set is that it's comprised of, uh, of time series data uh, with missing values and irregular spacing in between observations. 
Um, the method that we're going to use for the prediction is a random forest, which is a very, uh, very um, state of the art, but easy to use method in the realm of machine learning. It uh, provides good predictions in particular on tabular data, but it's still easy to use and easy to interpret com compared to other methods. So let's revise the task that we are targeting on this data set. We want to uh, provide a tool that is easy to use that um, achieves an early detection of neonatal jaundice, especially it, uh, it uh, allows us to predict early whether or not a child will require phototherapy up to 48 hours in advance. With that tool, we want to personalize the prediction, which is currently based on uh, conventional methods such as nomograms, which are a, basically a rule of thumb based on population averages. And with that tool, which again should be easy to use in a clinical context, we want to provide a safeguard against too early discharge. So here you see a screenshot of the prototype that we've built as an online tool, which is publicly available. Uh, this online tool incorporates a machine learning model for the personalized prediction of neonatal jaundice. Um, Again, we provide an early prediction up to 48 hours in advance of a phototherapy. And uh, with, the, with the model that, that's integrated in that tool, we achieve a strong predictive performance of 95% area under the rock curve. And uh, as I said, we wanted to make this tool as easy to use as possible. So we, we stripped the variables the, the inputs that are required for the tool down to only four variables. In particular, this means that, for instance, if we look at the feature importance, which is a, a proxy for the, the influence of variables in a random forest, if you look at it, and here we plot the, a subset of the 20 most important features in the model, um, we can, by doing backward variable selection, for instance, find that only four variables suffice to achieve the performance that we've reported on the previous slide. Uh, in particular, those inputs are, on the one hand, the bilirubin value, obviously, the weight of the child, its gestational age, and the hours that have passed since the birth. So let me just say a big thank you to our collaborators from the University uh, Hospital of Basel, and uh, thanks to you for listening. And let me just point out that uh, we have a poster as well, so please feel free to visit us. Thanks a lot. Thank you a lot, Iman, for interesting talk and for keeping on time. And with this, I would like to hand on to the next speaker. Okay, so and our next and uh, last speaker today is uh, Sinjai Liu, uh, who is a PhD student in the group uh, of Gimnar Reich at ETH Zurich. And today she will present us a new computational approach to extract cancer mutational signature from small cohorts of patients. So you are welcome. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Xin Rei. I'm from the Biomedical Informatics Group, led by Professor Gunnar Rush at ETH. Today I'm going to talk about our work on supervised mutational signature learning. And this work is also accepted by ISMB this year, and you can find the publication DOI down here. So to start with, I probably need to explain what is in them. But first, I also need to introduce the concept of mutational profile for those of you who are not familiar with it. The mutational profile we're looking at here in this project is the summary of counts of somatic single base substitutions with their immediate five prime and three prime contacts. A mutational signature looks a lot like a mutational profile, except that it is the summary of frequencies instead of count. A mutational profile can be seen as the weighted addition of different mutational signatures, and the weights are usually called exposures. So mutational signatures can help us to understand the underlying mutation processes in cancer patients. There are some mutational signature extraction methods out there already, but they depend on the size and variance of the patient cohort and do not exploit the metadata, such as cancer types. Also, they model the mutation accounts with Poisson distribution, which is the negative binomial distribution. 
So we propose a supervised mutational signature learning model that utilizes the metadata by integrating supervised learning, which could reduce the dependence on the size and variance of the patient cohort and help us to learn more robust mutational signatures, even from small cohorts. Also, we're trying to do the right thing here by modeling the count data with negative binomial distribution. So here's the math. We first decompose the mutational profile matrix into a mutational signature matrix and an exposure matrix using non-negative matrix factorization. And we try to find the best solution under the negative binomial distribution assumption by minimizing this negative log likelihood function. We then added the classification loss from SVN classifiers on the metadata into the picture, which will give us box. And we optimize the objective function using majorization minimization method. Here are some results. We evaluated our model on the largest collection of whole genome of cancer and used the cancer type as the classification label. And we also used five-fold cross-validation in our experiments. Here, we compare the signatures learned by our model, which is dubbed as SNBMMF, and the unsupervised model, which is dubbed as NBMMF, was the reference signature set. We can see from these two figures down below, the signatures learned by our model performed the best in terms of both reconstruction error and uh, classification accuracy on 45 cancer types. Another experiment we did is to extract uh, mutational signatures from Sometimes we'll lose your voice uh, for, for several seconds. Oh, oh where? Can you repeat uh, 10 seconds back? Uh, so we, we were able to hear you, but just if you repeat your last two sentences, it will be perfect. Thank you. Uh, so starting from here? I think you can go to the next slide. Yes. Okay. So, so be, yes, this slide. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. Another experiment that we did is to uh, extract mutational signatures from a small cohort with only six cancer types, most of which are related to BRCA1 and 2 mutation. And here we compare the best matching signature from our model and the unsupervised model with the reference signature 3, which is highly associated with BRCA1 and 2 mutation. We can see from the result that the signature learned by our model is more similar to the reference signature, both so we the hear. signatures learned. Okay. Uh, can you Good. hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. so to, con <laughs> to conclude, with supervision, the signatures learned by our model are more predictive of the cancer type and still yield lower reconstruction error. And they're also more robust, even when the training cohorts are small. And there are more cool stuff our model can do, one of which is to force specific signature to be associated with certain molecular feature, such as alpha back expression. And for more information, you can also find me in the poster session uh, one. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Questions are welcome. Thank you very much. So I think we go to general discussion, Katya. Um, so thanks to all the speakers for the exciting talks. I'm, I'm really excited that it turned out so well. And uh, I also uh, thank the attendees for their active participation. We've collected now quite some questions. And the audience members should now join the Meet the Speaker session, um, where we will ask the questions from the Q&A feature. And for this, uh, as you see here, um, just leave the current session and click on the camera symbol next to the Meet the Speaker session of session one in the program. And there we will meet again, um, yeah, just now. <laughs> Thank you.